Good morning, everybody. Let's all stand. Let's put our hands together this morning. Let's forget about everything that's going on outside these walls. Just focus on Him. Come on, let's turn it up. We're gonna sing it out for all the world to hear. Oh, oh, oh. There's life for everyone. A new day has begun. Something to shout about. us down. We found our voice again. Oh, 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 oh. No need for fear and shame. There's power in His name. Come on, let freedom reign. Let it be known that our God saves. Our God reigns. We lift you up, up. Let it be known that love has come. Love has won. We lift you up, up. Continue worshiping this morning. Say 
the Lord Almighty. I love that song because I love that thought. Who can stop the Lord? Nobody. Are you listening? Nobody can stop the Lord. He's going to do what he is going to do. Amen? Boy, that's a little weak. Let's try it again. He is going to do what he's going to do. Amen? And he is always working and has our best interest at heart. You know what blows me away about that, that phrase? Who can stop the Lord? Nobody can. The president, uh, Putin, uh, Saddam Hussein, nobody could stop the Lord. But watch this. But he invites us as his children into his presence to pray. The Bible says, ask anything in my name according to my will and it will be done. Let me tell you, nobody can stop the Lord. But if you are his child, you have his undivided attention anytime you want it. And that is a huge, amazing privilege that we have to go into the presence of God and ask anything of him. And I just want to encourage you, if you're not praying, you need to be praying because that is how we talk to our father God. Amen. If you're our guest today, let me tell you why we're always excited here because we know that God changes lives. You know how we know that? Because he's changed ours. And maybe you're here today, maybe for the first time, or maybe you've been coming for a long time and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, you know what? something's missing. Maybe you need that change that only he can give. I want to encourage you today, if you've never have, give your life to Christ because he makes all the difference in the world. Amen. Amen. We love you. If you're visiting, we're so glad you're here. Do us a favor. In the seat back, you'll see a card called a connect card. If you'll take that card out today and fill it out for us at the conclusion of today's service, go right out into the lobby and to your left over by the water fountains, there's a table there called uh, the connect table. There will be some people there. Just take that card to them, give it to them. We're going to give you a guest bag. It's got a few little goodies in it, a couple, a couple things you can use, uh, but it's also got some information about our Bible study groups. And it's got contact information in there to reach out to us. If you have any questions that you'd like answered, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I promise you, if you fill out that card, someone's like, yeah, I fill out the card, but I don't want y'all showing up for dinner at my house on visitation night. I promise you, we will not do that. 
We'll reach out to you first and let you know that we're coming and what our dietary needs are. (laughs) I'm only joking, but uh, we would. We really would appreciate the opportunity to reach back out to you. So please take that back there as soon as the service today is concluded. I've got a few announcements real quick after the service today. You know, our kids are going to camp here in just a few weeks. So do us a favor. They're having their last bake sale right over here in the, the hallway area between the lobby and the Children's Center. Stop by there at the ap- after service today. There's some goodies there you can buy. We need to put them out of business. It's their finer ba- final bake sale, and all the proceeds of that go directly to the cost of different kids' camps. If their moms or grandmas or grandpas or, or dads made the items, uh, we sell them to each other, and then those proceeds go to their camp. So you'd be helping out a family and getting something really good to eat all at the same time. So please stop by there. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, we are having our Discover Central class. You're like, what is that? Well, people that have been coming for a while, or maybe today you showed up for the first time, you're like, you know what? I think this might be where God would have me to join forces with this church body to affect this community. We want to invite you to come to Discover Central. We'll share with you a little bit about the church's history, but we're going to share more with you about where we're at right now and what's going on and the vision that God has given us to do the work of the ministry right here in this area of town. So we would love for you to join us this afternoon at four. There's no pressure to join the church. It's just an offer for you to do so if you would like to. And at the conclusion of our uh, little class time together, we'll have a meal together. Be a great time of fellowship. We'd love to have you with us this afternoon at four o'clock, but I do need to know you're coming. So at the end of service, I'll be out there in the lobby. If you're gonna come and you've not yet signed up, just come by and let me know. If you've already signed up, you don't have to let me know, but if you can, if you can make it this afternoon, Let me know you'll be joining us and we'll make sure we have enough food. Vacation Bible School. It's called Twist and Turns. It's coming up in July. It's going to be the 10th to the 14th. It's from 6 to 8.30 p.m. in the evenings. We still need some volunteers. How many of you have already signed up to volunteer for Twist and Turns VBS? Raise your hand. Now, that's pretty good, but, but I see a lot of hands that aren't up. We could use your help. You say, well, I can't give five evenings. If you can give two or three, that'd be great. Get signed up. We'll contact you and let you know where you'll be serving and what we need you to do. We would really appreciate the help. Um, If you've not yet signed your kids up for VBS, go to our sign-up page. And by the way, you can sign up for everything at cbc.live. Right in the center of the page, it says sign up. You click on that and just scroll down to whatever it is you're signing up for and get signed up. Um, if, if your kids aren't signed up yet, please get them signed up. We need to start knowing how many we got to prepare for because we're ordering a lot of things, crafts and different stuff. Um, coming up June 25th, June 25th, we're having our Raised to Life baptism service. And I always love I love, love our baptism services. On that same day, we'll have communion. So on that one Sunday morning, we will uh, exercise both of the ordinances that the Lord Jesus gave to the church, communion and baptism. And we'll talk more about it on that day, but I love both of those ordinances because both of those ordinances tell us to remember what? Doesn't tell us to remember the birth of Jesus. It tells us to remember the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so on that day, it's a great emphasis, a great day of celebrating as people follow Jesus Christ in believers' baptism. If you've never done so, we want to invite you to be baptized this coming June 25th, but you all need to sign up. Go to our website, cbc.live, click sign up. First one there says raise to life. Click on it and get signed up. If you've never been scripturally baptized, what does that mean? After you've been saved, say, well, I was baptized when I was a baby and I got saved when I was 15. Well, you need to get your baptism in its proper order and we would invite you to do that. So if you would get signed up, we'll reach out to you and answer any questions that you have at that time. Awesome. We've got a one more youth camp. Youth camp's coming up in July and we've got one more fundraiser lined up and it's gonna be on Sunday, July the 2nd. How many of you like to eat after church? Come on, all right, everybody eats after church. In fact, sometimes during church, you're thinking, gosh, I wish Roy would hurry up. I want to go eat. All right. Um, Well, on that day, we're going to have lunch served right next door in the Family Life Center. We're going to have these massive baked potatoes, and there's going to be chopped uh, beef to go on them and all the other stuff you could put on a baked potato. It's going to be a good time of fellowship and lunch right here. You don't have to go anywhere. You just walk over and have lunch. It'll be $10 a person and all the profits from that are going to go towards our teen camp. So we'd appreciate it if you would stay and eat with us that day. That'd be awesome. And don't forget one more time to get your kids signed up 
for VBS. We are getting ready. We're excited because it's our, um, we're back to live VBS. And so it's going to be great. We're going to do it in the evenings and we need your help. Let's all stand together. We're fixing to sing another worship song together right after this. And I want to encourage you as we sing this morning, this last worship song, lift your heart to Jesus as though he's standing right in front of you and you're thanking him for what he's done for you. If God has done something for you this morning, say amen. amen. Well, then we need to be singing praise to him this morning together. Let's lift our hearts and make sure heaven hears us as we sing to him this morning. It's not about the person next to you, in front of you, or behind you. It's all about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise you, God, and we thank you so much for your goodness to us. God, you are so, so faithful to us. And Lord, we, we love you so much. I pray, God, that if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. Today would be the day that they say yes to you. God, I pray that you'd be with Pastor Rick when he comes in a few moments. Empower him with your Holy Spirit. Use the words that are spoken to challenge us, to grow us, and to draw us closer to you. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
You may be seated. has been in the ministry for almost 50 years. He doesn't look old enough to have been in the ministry for 50 years, but I'll tell you one of the things that I love and respect about him so much is he is so passionate about the Word of God, and he loves to teach it and to preach it, and he has been a great friend of my father and myself for many, many years, and he has served, he pastored in uh, Mississippi, and then he went and was the vice president of Baptist Bible College, and then he went down to Richardson, Texas, where he pastored, and then he went back to Mississippi because the people there wanted him to come back, and then when he got done there and was retired, then he went and became the president of Louisiana Baptist University, of which you all know much about because our pastor's on the board of directors there, and uh, so it, and now he's retired, but he has not quit. He is booked solid. He's preaching all the time in many different places. And so I'll let him tell you more about what God's doing in his life, but you welcome him if he makes his way this morning. Amen. Thank you, Brother Rick. Thank you, Pastor. It is a joy to be here with you. I love coming to Central Baptist Church. I, I love both of your pastors. I love both of them. As a matter of fact, I, I do pray for Brother Roy and Shirley and their family. I pray for Brother Larry Maddox and Miss Debbie, and I pray for this church on a daily basis. I've done that for several years now, and uh, so I, I love being here. I said to the first service this morning that uh, when I'm with uh, Brother Roy and, of course, Dr. Maddox, uh, I feel kind of like what Paul said in regards to Onesimus. I am re often refreshed because of you, and that's exactly how I feel when I have an opportunity to visit with them. It's a blessing to be here with you today. I'm going to invite you, please, to open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs today. You know, a lot of people, sometimes church people don't realize it, but the summertime is one of the most expensive times for a church. Uh, utilities are up higher. Uh, you have youth camps that I'm sure this church is uh, like our church is, that kids who cannot afford to pay their own way. And uh, we never... We never uh, Caused them to stay home. We always anted up the money at the church. I mean, it's just, there's just a lot of expenses during this time of year. And if I can get all hooked back up here, uh, that you don't really think of in regards to church ministry. So because of that, I, I want to talk to you today in regards to a subject that's very precious to me. Some people see it as a negative. I see it as a tremendous positive. And that is, I want to talk to you about giving today. Uh, you know, in my, let, let me begin by saying this. Number one, if you've never given your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, let today be the day. I, I Let today be the day. The, the, the greatest gift you'll ever receive is the gift of Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He'll walk with you the rest of your life, and when you die, he'll take you to heaven. What a gift, amen? That's so wonderful. Open your Bibles with me, as I said, to Proverbs chapter number three. I'm going to read two verses of Scripture, and then we'll launch into my message today. Again, I, let me say this, I apologize. I have preached with a PowerPoint presentation for the last, I'm sure, 20 plus years of my ministry. We had one for this service here this morning. Uh, my wife and I, we packed it somewhere in one of our suitcases 
and uh, we don't know which word, where it is. So uh, we're going to have to do church today the old-fashioned way. Now, some of you are younger. You've probably never done it old-fashioned. Well, we're going to have to look in your own Bible today, okay? So sorry for that, but nevertheless, it'll help you find the books of the Bible, and I apologize for that. But in the book of Proverbs, chapter number uh, three here, we're going to look here at verses nine and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increases. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. I want to talk to you today about the three greatest days of my life. The three greatest days of my life. The first greatest day of my life was the day I received Jesus Christ as my personal savior. I did not grow up in a Christian home. My mother was a good woman, a very hardworking woman. She was a very stern woman. My, when my mother spoke, you know, you knew you better respond. And you better do what she said because she never spoke the second time. In my day with my mother, uh, she took action the next time. As a matter of fact, after I was grown, had a family of my own, we was over at my mother's house one day and my mother and dad sitting there and the, and the news came on and, and they were talking about people abusing children and this kind of stuff. And I said to my mother, I said, you know, mom, if you were raising us today, we, we could probably have you arrested and put in jail. And without a beat, she said these words, yeah, but you better pray to God I never got out. <laughs> that was my mother. Some of you may have had one similar to that too. I don't know, I, but, but that was my mother. But you know, my mother was a wonderful, wonderful woman. My dad, uh, he was not a saved man. Uh, my dad was a drunkard. Uh, he and his brothers made bootleg whiskey and they sold bootleg whiskey. And so I did not grow up in a Christian home. I, I probably, from the time I was uh, born to the time I was, I got saved, I probably had not been to church. You could probably count them all on your, all in one hand like this right here. Uh, we, we were not a Christian family whatsoever. But then when I was 15 years old, my dad, just prior to this time, he was arrested for bootlegging there. We, we lived in Mobile, Alabama. And my dad, uh, had been arrested the third time for bootlegging whiskey. And so uh, he entered a plea bargain with the judge. He promised the judge if he would not send him to prison or to jail, one, that he would move out of the state of Alabama, and number two, he would stop uh, making and bootlegging whiskey. And so the judge accepted his plea bargain, and we moved just out across the Alabama line over into Mississippi in a little town called Pascagoula, Mississippi. Uh, it's actually where our nation's largest shipyard is there, but the only thing most people know about Pascagoula is that's where the squirrel went berserk. Some of you recognize that song, all right. So uh, we, did, we moved over to Mississippi. My dad did keep half of his bargain. He did move out of Mississippi, out of Alabama into Mississippi, but he didn't quit making whiskey and bootlegging whatsoever. He just got a new set of customers that he never had before. So uh, he was not saved. And then I'm 15 years old, I'm working, I'm working a job. Uh, I'm working at Charlie Bird's Gulf Station, the corner of Market Street and, high, and the highway there. Um, and so uh, I'm working six nights a week after school until like uh, 10 o'clock at night. And uh, so uh, the only night I'm off is on Sunday and in Mississippi at that time, you could get your driver's license those days at age 15. I, I got my driver's license. I bought me a 49 Ford, paid $50 for it. It had been painted with a hand brush, had no floorboards in it, but that was no problem. I just put plywood right in there. You know those nice days, you had those nice cars. Remember those days? And uh, so uh, uh, I asked this girl if she would go out on a date with me. And uh, she said, yes, boy, that shook me up, you know. And I was so excited. I went by her house on a Sunday afternoon and I said to her, now, hey, I just want to remind you, I'll be about to pick you up tonight at six o'clock. And about the time I said that, there was a, a, a head that came out behind the door, come to find out it was her mother. And she said to me, uh, young man, if you're going to date my daughter, you got to come to church tonight. And I said, no, ma'am, I'm, I'm not coming to church tonight. Elaine, I, we, we have a date tonight. Well, then she stepped out from behind the door and she came outside and she got close to my face and she said, now, young man, understand what I'm going to tell you. If you don't show up at church tonight, you're not going anywhere with my daughter. I believe I understood that. And so what happened? I show up at church that night. It's a little bitty startup church, a little small, tiny auditorium. There are not 20 people in that auditorium, 15 to 20 people in there. And, I, and that night I, I go in there and of course, I, like I said, I don't remember when the last time I'd gone to church was, but I'd not gone too many times. 
And uh, this preacher gets up and begins to preach, and he preaches on hell on Sunday night. And I'm thinking, "Uh uh-huh, that old biddy, she told him I was coming. But that that night, he gave the invitation, I trusted Christ as my personal Savior at 15 years of age. Wow. It's the greatest day of my life. I thank God for that opportunity to get saved. And I thank God that God saved me, and the Lord has been working in my life ever since. My second greatest day in my life was the day I married this woman right down here. Uh, It's been 52 years Uh, We were both very young. I think she was uh, seven and I was nine or something like that when we got married, I think. Uh, Well, maybe a little older than that, but uh, the day that uh, we got married, uh, she has truly been the completer in my life. Uh, I'll tell you, I thank God for her. She's been right there by my side through everything that we have done, everywhere we have gone, know what we've done. I never had to wonder, was my wife supported or was she not supported? She's always been there. Now, and she's always imparted wisdom to me, and she's been nothing but a true blessing to my life. But the day I want to tell you about, the day has been a tremendous blessing in my life, was this. The day I learned to be a giver. The day that I learned to be a giver. You know, because of the curse of the sin nature, none of us are born with a giving nature. Because we are all born with a sin nature. And one aptitude of the sin nature is selfishness. And and we all are looking for self, self. That's that's what we are naturally by ourselves. But yet when you get saved, the Spirit of God comes to live inside of us. And we have a new nature, a new spirit inside of us. And that new nature is totally opposite to that old nature. The old nature is selfish. It's all about me and my needs and what I want. And the other nature is always a giving nature because Jesus Christ comes to live inside of us the day we get saved through the person of the Holy Spirit. And it was Jesus who said to us, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, the old nature always wants to get, 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 get. But that's not the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk to you today about becoming a giver. Let me, I'll, I'll share a little more of my, of my testimony. I'd, I'd only been saved a, a short time. I don't remember how long again. It's been a long time ago. But I came to church one Sunday morning, and I was, one of the, I, I was always the first person there to get there and the last person to leave besides those who locked the door. And I just loved going to church. I couldn't get enough of it. I mean, I, I went every time the doors was open. I, I, I got saved. Boy, I'm telling you, it just totally changed my life. I was 15 years old. And so this one particular Sunday morning, I, I come in the back door and the preacher, some of you probably seen in some churches, they will have like what they call the communion table right down here in front. And they'll generally have some flowers on it or something like that. And the preacher was leaning over the communion table and he was I, like he was writing something. So I, I came in the back door, a much smaller church than this. And uh, I, I said to him, good morning, preach. How are you? He said, I'm doing fine. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm filling out my tithing envelope. Now remember, I have only been saved a few weeks. I don't remember how long, three weeks, four weeks, whatever it was, but a very short time. And I said to him, you're filling out your what? And he said, my tithing envelope. And he stopped, he turned and looked at me. And by this time, I'm walking down there. And he said to me, you don't know about tithing? I said, preacher, I never heard of it. He said, come here and sit down. And he sat me down in the front row and he got his Bible and he opened up his Bible and he began to show me about being a tither and a giver. And then he said to me, he said, don't you work a job? And I said, well, yes, sir, I do. (laughs) And he said, how much money do you make? Now, can you imagine coming to join the church here? They sit down here and say, are you working a job? Yeah, how much money did you make? (laughs) Uh, You'd be right at the door. But God had a plan and a purpose for my life. And by the way, God has a plan and a purpose for your life also. And so he said, how much money did you make this week? I don't remember now what I made, uh, but I think I said something like $20 or something like that. And uh, so uh, he said, well, then you owe God $3. I'm just sitting there looking at him. He said, you owe God $2 for tithe, and and the Bible says bring all your tithes and your offerings into the storehouse. And he says, so you owe God $2 for tithes and you owe God $1 as a love offering. I'm just sitting there. He looks at me and he says, you got $3? 
And I, well, I think so. He said, well, get your wallet out. Let's look and see. So I get my wallet out. Sure enough, I had three $1 bills. And he took out a tithing envelope. And he, he said, here, fill this out. And so I, I wrote my name down there. And he said, now put out tithe. Put out $2 right there. And put out for offerings $1 right here. And put total you gave it's going to be $3 today. Folks, that was outside of my salvation. That was one of the greatest days of my life. You know why? Because God helped me become a giver when I was 15 years old. I, ha I have never received a paycheck or a gift or a love offering or any kind of financial income in my life since that day that I didn't tithe and give offerings out of it. And I'm not, more, I don't want to sound braggadocious about anything, but I'm telling you, you're looking at a guy that God has been so very good to me. I could sit here and tell you stories about giving here until it, it, it would consume our whole entire time here this morning. God has been so good to me. Based on our text here, the Bible tells us here the purpose in stewardship. The purpose was to teach us that God is the owner of all things. Proverbs 24 and verse number one says, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. You see, you and I are not owners. You and I actually own nothing. Now, I know we say, you know, I own this car, I own this house, I own this piece of land, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But truly, biblically, you and I are not, we don't own any of that. If you own a home, probably most of you, that home used to be titled in someone else's name. And if the Lord doesn't come back, it will eventually be a, a titled to somebody else's name because you'll pass away someday. I mean, we are only pilgrims. We're passing through this world. We don't own anything here. We are only stewards. God is the only owner that there is. Now, listen to me here. Owners, the difference between a steward and an owner is this. Owners have rights. Stewards have responsibilities. None of us here are owners. All we are are stewards. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. God is the only owner, and you and I, we are stewards. You see, pride comes from believing that you and I are the source of our wealth. Oh, I've had people tell me, well, preacher, I got what I got. I worked hard for it. Well, so what? There's a lot of people who worked hard that may not have what you have. But that's pride. Pride comes from believing you're the source of your own wealth. And stinginess comes from believing that you are an owner and you don't own anything. Everything you have, your life, your time, your talents, your treasures, they are bestowed upon you for a period of time. And then one day you and I must face God with what we have done with them. God is the only owner. And the Bible starts out here by saying, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all all of thine increases. So what we see here that first of all, God's purpose in our stewardship is to help us to understand he's the owner, we are the steward. Secondly, there's the product of our stewardship and that is with all our substance, we are to honor the Lord. Again, we are to honor the Lord with our time, with our talents and with our treasures. I've had people who were who was members of my church say, oh preacher, you know, I, I, I would love to be involved in this ministry of the church or that ministry of the church or this ministry, but, but I just don't have time to do that. Then you need to change your life. You need to change your time schedule. Because I'm telling you, was all, as the saying goes, there's only one life and, and, and only what's done for Christ will last in eternity. What are you doing with your time? How are, you, how are you serving God with your life? The product of our stewardship is with thy substance. Honor the Lord with everything that you have, with your time, you, with your talents, with your treasures. Can I tell you this? God did not save anyone and say to you, I just want you to go into the church on Sunday mornings, but don't be involved in anything and don't tithe and don't serve. God never told anybody that. But yet today, churches are literally full of people here in Houston and around this, our greater America today that they will walk in the doors, they will sit here for their time, they'll go out those doors and never serve God with any way with their life. You are being cheated by Satan. 
That is not God's plan for your life. God has given you time. God has given you talents. And God has given you treasures. And God expects you to serve God with every bit of that in your life. Now, let me also, I want to take a little byway here. And I want to mention something else to you. And I, I want to ask you a question here. You know, number one reason why during my years of pastoring, and as Pastor Roy said, I, I pastored almost 45 years. The number one reason why people would say to me, preacher, I don't tithe, and the reason why is, listen to this, I can't afford to. That automatically tells me that they have been listening to the devil. God has never told you you, can, you are excused from giving your tithes and offerings. God has never told you that. So it tells me, number one, that person has been listening to the devil, number one. Number two, it tells me that they now believe the lie of the devil, and the lie of the devil, when he says it like this right here, oh, you can't afford to, what he is saying is that if you give to God through your local church, you are going to have less and want to be able to meet your needs, and that is a lie. That, that is a total lie right there. That's what Satan wants you to believe. And a lot of Christian people, they will trust God with their souls, but they don't feel like they can trust God with their money. Can I tell you today, I would never trust a God with the value of my soul if God could not be trusted with my money. Amen. Oh, think about it, folks. The Bible says, what shall a man should profit if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? In other words, God says, your soul is more valuable than all the goods of the world. Here's the problem. One, you've been listening to the devil. If you're not a tither, you've been listening to the devil. And the devil tells you you can't afford it. Or whatever excuse he gives you, it's a lie from the devil. Now, I want to mention something else to you here. Secondly, I want to ask you this. Are you a saver? Do you save money? Do you have a regular savings account, an investment account? You know, Brother Roy mentioned that I, I'm, I'm no longer working a job. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't get the big check every Friday anymore. Uh, my wife and I, we use this phrase for our life. We're not retired. We have repurposed our life. But the same thing, we don't get the big check anymore. But you know what? Years ago in our life, we knew if Jesus did not come back, the day was going to come when I would no longer be working the job and getting the big check every Friday. And so we, we begin to plan and we begin to save money for this time in our life. Are you a saver? You see, if you're not careful, you'll, you'll begin to live from payday to payday. And, and that is biblically wrong for you to do that. Listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs 6 and verse 6. Go to the ant. The God's going to give us an illustration here. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, and consider her ways and be wise. Now, what's, the indir what's God saying to you indirectly here? The, the, the ant does something that you're not doing, and the ant is wise, and you're not wise. What is the opposite of not being wise? Being foolish. And he says here, which having no guide or overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in harvest. In other words, what the, the principle here that God is giving us is there is a work period of your life. And if the Lord doesn't come back, all of you one day are going to grow old just like me. And you're not going to be having a job anymore. And what are you going to live off of? Are you going to live on welfare? Are you going to live in poverty? What are you going to do? Or are you going to become savers? You see, in the process of living life, everything tears up and quits. Whatever car you're driving today, at some point in time, you're probably going to have to buy another one. And you know what you're going to do? You're either going to pay cash or you're going to borrow money and pay high interest rates. If you own a washing machine and a dryer, at some time, it's going to break, and they're going to say, we, we, can't, we don't have parts for this anymore. You're going to have to buy another one, and you're either going to have to pay cash, or you're going to have to pay interest rates. Same thing happens with the washing machine, and with everything we have, everything in this world here is temporal. So my point is today, God gives us the principle of being a saver in life. And, and, and let me give you one more passage of Scripture. Look, look with me, if you would, please, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 25. 
In Matthew 25, listen here in verse number 14. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a country and who calleth his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Now, the, the person here who's traveling the, here is, is the picture and type of God. The servants are you and I, and his goods are the time, talents, and treasures that God has given to you and to me. Now, look at what he says. And to one he gave five talents. Now, five. by the way, the talent here doesn't mean he's able to dance real good or sing real good. That's not the way the talent means. The word talent was a measure of money in the Bible. It was a measure of money. And a talent that that day, today, one talent today with inflation from that time to this, one talent would be equal to approximately $1,500. So God gave this first individual here, he, he, he delivers to him five talents, which means he gave to him about $7,500. And to the second one, he gives two talents, and to one man, he gives one talent. Now, God gives to all of us. But now I want you to notice the difference. He says here then, verse 16, he that received five talents went and traded with the same and made five talents more. And, and likewise, he that had received two talents, uh, he also gained two other talents. But he that had received the one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Now, you and I, look here, you and I are living in verse 19. We are living in verse 19. The Lord, you are here, I'm here. God has given you your talents, your time, your talents, your treasures that God has given to you. And then he says, after a long time, the Lord cometh and reckoneth with them. Judgment day has not come for me and you yet, but it's on the horizon. You one day will stand before God Almighty. Now listen to me. You and I both will stand before God Almighty, and you will give an account to God for every penny that's ever gone through your hands that you are responsible for, and so will I. And, 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 and so he, and, and look, so these people begin to stand before God. Now, this is a picture of the coming judgment seat of Christ where you and I will stand. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord." God blessed him. God said to him, thank you. You did a wonderful job, and I'm going to reward you now in your eternal life. Second man comes up. He said, Lord, you gave me two talents. And he said, thou deliverest to me two talents, and I've gained beside them two other talents. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Same thing with the second man. You see, not all of us have the same talents. Not all of us have the same abilities, but yet God has given you the, the ability to be what he wants you to be in your life. You don't, you don't need to judge yourself by somebody else sitting in this auditorium. Some of you here today, you have, you have more talent, so to speak, in your little finger than I got in my whole body. But what are you doing with it? How are you serving God with it, with your whole entire life? That's what he's saying. Now, then the one comes up who God gave him one talent. Look what he says here. He said in verse 24, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathered where thou hast not strown. Huh. Now what did this guy do? Number one, he began to say, God, you're not fair. You're, you're a dishonest God. That's what he began to say about him. And, and, and he said, he began to lie. He said, God, you're requiring something of me that you've never given to me. Well, where did he get his talent to start with? God gave him, the, the, the master gave it to him. That's a picture of what God has given to you and I. And so number one, he began to lie, to try to lie to, to, to his master. And number two, he tried to make excuses. And I want to tell you something, friend, there is no excuse you're going to have that you and I are going to have the day we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's commandment to us is that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. And if when you love God like that, I'm telling you, giving is no problem for you. 
It's not, and you, you want to follow the commands of God, not only in your giving, but you want to follow the, the commands of God in being a saver. And if you don't get anything else out of this message today, let me say this to you. If you don't have a savings account, you're not a saver. You ought to get right with God today and promise God tomorrow you're going to go to the bank and you're going to start a savings account. Because you need to. That is biblical, my friend. That's Bible right there. If you're spending up everything you get every week and you're living from payday to payday, you're living wrong according to the Bible. That's not how God ordained you to live. And I'll tell you something. You need to make the proper changes in your life. And so we see but how, how, we, how we get our money and how we give our money and what we do with our money, one day we will all stand before God and give an account. And then we see the priority of our stewardship. And that is the first fruits of all thine increases. Everything God has given to you, you ought to give a portion of it back to God. Everything. He said, honor the Lord. In other words, put God first in your life. Put God first, and I've already said today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we're giving you today the greatest opportunity of your life to be able to come to Christ and receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. And he will walk with you and live with you. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Your darkest day, God will be right there with you, right beside you. What a bargain in God. What a bargain. And so we see here that the product of, of our stewardship is of the first fruits of all thine increases. I used to have people ask me, well, preacher, are we supposed to tithe before, before taxes or after taxes? Well, that answers that question. The first fruits of all thine increases, you give to the Lord in that very way. And then there's the promise of his givings. He said here in verse number 10, go back to the book of Proverbs, look at God's promise. Do you believe the promises of God? I pray you do. I hope you do. In Proverbs chapter number three, and verse number 10, he says, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. Now you, you could change that. That word plenty here didn't say he would make you the richest man in Houston. He didn't say that. Plenty means the same word can be translated as being sufficient. Sufficient is how God said he would bless you. He would make it sufficient for you in your life. And, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Luke chapter six and verse 38 says it like this. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosoms. Now, shall men give into your bosoms indicates two things. One, somebody is a giver. Number two, somebody is a receiver. Are you a giver? I mean, do you, do you regularly, faithfully give to the ministry of this church? Are, are you helping send missionaries around the world? Are you going to help send people to youth camp? Do you know, to this day, I got saved when I was 15 years old. And that summer, I don't know who did it, somebody, my daddy was out of work. And I mean, we, he and I had a little old bitty push mower, had the back of our car, and we were going around and I was knocking on doors. Can, sir, can we mow your grass? We'll, we'll do it for a dollar. We were just trying to get something to put on the table. And, and I remember they, they, they said to me, we want you to go to youth camp. And I said, I don't have any money to go to youth camp. And, and, and one of them said, well, hey, we'll get somebody to pay you away if you want to go. I never said a word to them. And lo and behold, about just a few days before, they said, we got somebody who's paid your way to go to camp if you want to go. I went to youth camp. I won't tell you all that story. But I'll tell you what I did on, on, on the last night of that youth camp. A man by the name of W.E. Dow was preaching. He asked, how many of you would tell God, God, you can do anything in my life you want to do? I thought, you know what? That's only reasonable. And that night I walked down there. I was sitting on the very back row of this open air tabernacle. I walked down that, that night. I, I knelt down right here. And I don't know why. Of course, your, your, your pastor, Dr. Maddox, knows this man, Dr. W. Dowell. He's with the Lord now. But I knelt down right there where he, in front of the pulpit and that man came over and knelt down like this right here. Put his hand on my head and prayed for me. I have never forgotten that. Now later on the next year, I surrendered to preach. And but I'm telling you, my life was tremendously impacted that week by the teaching and the preaching of Dr. W. E. Dowell. And I don't know, 
I have no idea who paid my way to go to that camp. But I have preached in over 40 different countries of the world. I've pastored churches for almost 45 years. And I'm not trying to sound braggadocious, so please don't take it that way. But whoever gave that money for this little boy to go to youth camp is going to have a lot of rewards one day. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, there, verse number 6, so that neither is he that, water, that soweth or he that watereth anything, but it's God that giveth the increase. And so, my friend, when you give, you enter into every person's life who, who, who will ever be saved through this ministry. Do you, do you understand that? When you give to this church, you, you give into every young person's life that will go to camp this year and be changed. You, 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 you don't realize the opportunities that God's laying right here before you for all eternity. The promise is God says, I'll give it back to you. And so let me ask you a question. Are you, are, are you a tither? See, tithing is the starting line of giving. Tithing is not the finish line. That's the starting line. Tithing is not the ceiling of giving. It's the floor of giving. If you've been saved very long and you're still a tither, you need to grow. You need to increase your tithe 2%, 3%, 5%, or whatever it is. You, you, you need to get off that. That's, that's tithing under law. You see, today, a lot of Christian people, they, they, they want to they wanna live under grace they want to tithe under law. And you need to get all of it under grace. I'm not going to take the time to go there, but if you go to the gospel of Matthew chapter number five, you'll find out, and I've, I've heard preachers preachers saying, well, now if you can't tithe 10%, then just tithe 5% or 3%. That is not in the Bible. That is a total contradiction to the Bible. As a matter of fact, grace always requires more of us than the law does. If you don't believe me, go back and read Matthew chapter number five. Go back and read it. It makes a comparison to the law and to the grace, and grace is always more. And so I say to you today, are you a tither? If not, you ought to become a tither today. Because you know, if you, one day, the one day at, at the judgment seat of Christ, rewards are going to be handed out. And the Bible does say that some church people will be there Yet so as saved by fire. It means you've got nothing to show for your life, your time, your talents, or your treasures. I, I urge you, don't be that person. Don't be that person. Give, become a giver today. And so I ask you, do you need to start tithing? Number two, do you need to increase your tithe? How long has it been since you increased your tithe? And last of all, I ask you this. Do you need to get caught up on your tithe? I told you that about witnessing my dad the first night he got saved. And uh, my dad got very active in church. He and my mother, my mother got saved about a month or two after I got saved. They had a revival at the church. I invited my mother and my sister, who's just four years old, to me to go. And, and, and they both went, and both of them got saved. And, and then my, my, my dad ended up getting saved when I was a, a freshman in Bible college. I won't take time to tell you that, but, but he got saved. And he got in church. And, and I mean, he was loving and serving God. But I, 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 we only lived about an hour from my folks. And so we, we'd drive over to try to see him at least once or twice a month. And went over to see him. And my mother said to me, son, I want you to pray for your dad. And he said, your, dad, your dad's no longer going to church. And I said, what? Dad's no longer going to church. My dad was there every time the doors were open. My dad was there for work day. You name it, my dad was there. He was there for everything. And she said, yeah, dad's, uh, dad's no longer going and I, I went out there to talk to my dad. I went out on the front porch where he was sitting, and I said, Dad, Mom told me you're not going to church anymore. What, what happened? And my dad used to call me Ricky Boy. And he said, now, Ricky Boy, I don't want to talk about that. You understand? I said, but Dad, he said, now, Ricky Boy, I said, I don't want to talk about it. And my dad, when he didn't want to talk about it, he would not talk about it. And I said to him, I said, Dad, I'm going to start praying that God will get you back in church. And every day that you get up and you breathe every day of life, I want you to understand that I have prayed for you and I have asked God to get you right with him and get back in church. Let me skip several years. I'm overseeing my mom, my dad. And we're out there sitting on the porch again. My dad looks over at me and says, well, son, I got something to tell you. I know what it was. 
He said, I will tell you something. He said, Mom and I went to church yesterday. And I said, Dad, that's, that's great. He said, but, but there's more, son. He said, uh, and I went forward yesterday morning at the invitation, and I got my life right with God. And I'm telling you, my heart just, ex I mean, he just overflowed inside of me. I, I got up out of my chair, and my dad was a little smaller man than me, and I went over, and I just put my arms around him, and I picked him up, and I hugged him, and I said, Dad, I, I am, and I, just, I wept uncontrollably. I was so happy that Dad had gotten right with God. And I set him back down. I wiped the tears from my eyes. In just a few minutes, my dad said, uh, Ricky boy, and I said, yes, sir, Dad. He said, uh, listen to this. He said, our church had a, <clears throat> our little church. He always called his church the little church. And it was a small church, but he said, our little church had a great offering yesterday. I said, they did. I said, Dad, that's, that's good. I like that. I said, all of us preachers like the Sundays. We have good offerings. We have a lot of bad ones. He said, yeah. He said, last night, he said, I told Mom, Mom, go in there and get the checkbook out. And he said, figure out how much we owe God from the last time I went to church and the last time I tithed until now. And I want you to, to figure all of that up. And then he said, then add that 20% to it because I've been holding out on God. And he said, we had a good offering at our church last night. <sighs> Man, I went to crying again. But I wonder this. I wonder what the offerings here would be at Central next week if everybody who'd been holding out on God got right with God and come next Sunday morning and said, I'm getting right with God. You see, a lot of you have been away from God, and you want to come back into the altar and get, ask God to forgive you, and God will forgive you. But won't you get right financially? That's what my dad did. My dad said, I, I, I've been holding out on God, and I'm, I'm going to get everything right with God. Some of you are sitting here today, you've been holding out on God. You ought to get everything right. Let's stand, please, with our heads bowed, eyes closed. If I've been a little long, I apologize. I just have to look up at the clock. But I want to ask you today, what kind of steward are you? Are you a good saver? And that doesn't mean how much are you saving. It means the discipline with which you save. And are you a good giver? And if you're not either one of those, I want to encourage you today to covet with God that you will be a good saver and a good giver. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one's looking around but just me. I don't know any of you by name. I couldn't call any of your names. I wonder how many of you today would say to me, Preacher, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a saver, or my wife and I, we haven't been a saver. But I'm going to try to follow the Bible and do what you said that the Bible says this morning. And I'm going to endeavor to start a savings account and discipline myself to be a real good saver. I wonder how many of you would just be honest about it. I'm not, I'm not going to call your name, but how many of you would just say, I, I, I'm going to start practicing that because I believe it's right biblically. Would you raise your hand up? Just hold it up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. In the balcony. Thank you. God bless you. I encourage you this week to get her done, boys. If you can only start out with whatever amount it is, be a saver. Number two, I want to ask you this. I wonder how many of you would say today, preacher, I've not been a faithful tither and giver, but I believe it's right. And this morning, I, I'm going to commit myself to God that I'm going to become a tither and a giver. Would you slip your hand up? Just slip up and put it back down. God bless you. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you. I see that hand. Somebody else? Preacher, I know it's right. I haven't been doing it, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to commit myself. Somebody else? Somebody else? How about it? How about it? Oh, today, I pray you'll make things right with God. And I want to say one, two more things, and I'm through. If you're behind on your tithe, I want to encourage you to get caught up. And last of all, if you don't know Jesus, I'm going to invite you to come to Christ today. Now, some of you this morning who've made decisions about being tithers and givers, I encourage you to come and get on your knees around this altar. Just number one, to thank God for how he's blessed you. Number two, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, come to receive Christ as your Savior today. So many of you are givers here. It'd be a good time today just to come and get around this office and say, God, you've been so good to me, and I thank you once again, and I praise you for it. I'm going to pray, and we're going to have a verse two of invitation. If God's speaking to you, 
will you respond? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the kindness of these people to listen to me today. But Lord, more than listen to me, I pray, God, they have listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray you've put in each person's heart, God, what you'd have them to do. In your precious holy name, I pray. While our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, the instruments play us, and we lead us our musicians, lead us our invitation. If God's speaking to you, would you come? The altars are open for you to come. Will you come? All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I You may just want to come and say, God, you've been so good to me. You've just been so good to me, God. I want to come and just kneel here and say thank you. love and trust Him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Let's sing one more verse. My part's over. All to Jesus I surrender humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsake and take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Love that song. I think I say it every time we sing it, don't I, Brother Landon? Because that's really what God wants. He wants us to surrender all to Him. I've never met a happy, joy-filled Christian who is living a life of partial surrender. We have to be surrendered totally and completely to the Lord. And when we do, we'll experience the joy of the Lord. Some people are like, man, I just, you know, I get happy every now and then when something goes my way, but joy is just something I haven't experienced. Well, it's not because God doesn't make it available to you. It's because we're not living in obedience to him. And it, it may not be giving. That may not be your issue. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be honest. Giving to me is one of the easier parts. I mean, I just, that's a principle. Of course, being a preacher's kid, growing up in a preacher's home, it's a principle I understood from the time I was very young. Um, I didn't always practice it when I was a teenager and had a job. Uh, I was disobedient a lot of times, but boy, once I got that right, that part has been easy. It's, I, I struggle in other areas, but I'll tell you what, he wants all surrender, all obedience to him all the time. And I promise you, this is what I can promise you. If you do, you will have the joy of the Lord in your heart all the time, no matter what's going on in your life. Thank you. I want to say thank you. Uh, to Pastor Carter for one, for bringing this message today, but also thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Our church uh, has been able to help and be a part of many great ministries, and we've got a great ministry here, and thank you for your faithful support. And if you never have, you know what? Today's a great day to start. We thank you so much for your love and support. Don't forget, Discover Central this afternoon at four o'clock. If you've never come, and uh, maybe you've been coming to church here for a while, but you're like, well, I consider myself a member. Come join us at Discover Central this afternoon. I'll be right out there in the lobby. You come by and let me know you'll be coming. And the only reason I need to know is I got to know how much food to make sure we have so we can feed everybody who comes this evening. God bless y'all. Have a wonderful, safe, and good week. All right? Don't forget the bake sale. Bake sale. <laughs>